first of all, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and introduce myself. Um, so my name is Krista. I work at the Institute of Design, Oops. which um, is a graduate level um, and PhD uh, design program out of Chicago. So I'm visiting. Um, I wanted to th thank all of you um, tonight for, for being a part of this. Um, and Sarah Beth and, and Kate, who's out at the desk for, for hosting us tonight too. Um, we definitely appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we're glad to be here. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit about you know who we are kind of throughout the conversation. Specifically, Aaron here, our, our moderator, used to teach at our program. Um, but really, we're um, you know we're here to just continue the discussion about the changing field of design um, and. Um, like, you know, to hear about interesting work that alum, you know, old faculty, partners, you know, people doing interesting things in the field, um, like to have discussions around that. And so tonight is really about, um, you know, as this says, about uh, social impact. So how do you use design um, to make a social impact? And so they've all come with all sorts of stories to talk about. Um, we've also curated all of the questions um, everyone submitted um, when you registered. And definitely, because we've got a smaller group here, happy to keep this kind of an open discussion throughout the night. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you've got thoughts, uh, questions as we go, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, definitely, definitely want to hear what's on your mind as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to Aaron Heisinga. Awesome, you got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. It's good to see you here and um, meeting a few of you guys for the first time as we just sort of mixed and mingled. I hope to meet all of you before the evening is over. Um, so we're going to just get started. And, and as Krista said, everybody here on the panel um, has a different take on what social impact has looked like for them professionally and really personally, too. And that's why we're all here. So um, again, formal discussion, informal discussion, anything that you'd like to um, you know, just push us on or ask us, um, feel free to do that and we'll do some time for Q&A here at the end as well. Um, so also there are some post-it notes kind of lingering around, I believe. So if you have a question that you really want to make sure you remember to, to ask, you can write that down or just type it into your phone or whatever method is best for you and we'll make sure that we get to it in the Q&A at the end. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we'll just get started with the first kind of in, uh, d defining question around uh, what is design and how did we all come into this work? So Sarah Beth, you want to start? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Beth Burke. So currently, I'm the director of Futurebound, which is this beautiful banner next to me. And I've had a really interesting journey through design. So I love being on a design panel because I never get to. But I feel like this is more of my core than a lot of the other identities I wear. Um, another way I describe myself as being a hybrid professional because I literally have had a journey where I've accumulated a lot of professional identities and each one sort of defines who I am in a way and I blend all that together and design is one of my identities. So uh, just a little bit about my journey. Um, I went to undergrad to be an interior designer because I thought that was so cool but um, was at a public university and realized it was way too big and it wasn't the right program and then transferred to the Art Institute of Chicago and finished my undergrad in a visual and critical studies program, which was the best of both worlds. It was like a lot of studio art and I love just being creative, but it was a lot of theory and like academic and just critical analysis, but I didn't know what it set me up for. Um, and in my heart, I wanted to be a graphic designer. So I had a very traditional uh, notion of what design was when I was younger. Fast forward, I went to RISD and got a degree in art education, art and design education. So again, this core of design being about teaching and learning and um, creativity coming into it. And then fast forward further, I went and taught and then I got a degree in curriculum instruction because I realized the art teacher was just kind of making my world too narrow. And in that time when I was a doctoral student, I got exposed to entrepreneurship and start to learn about social entrepreneurship. And that just opened my mind because I had no idea you could solve problems that made impact and made money and changed the world. And it was creative and it was problem solving. I was like, these are all the things I love to do. Where has this been in my life? So that was my aha. Um, but how did I take that into education was sort of the next question. Um, I ended up getting into innovation programs. I worked at Denver Public Schools and helped transform uh, curriculum and school models and culture and admin and leadership and really got into design thinking. So that was another pivotal moment to realize 
Design is the way we look at the world and experiences are things we can design. And where someone moves through a building and how they learned about the, the idea to even come to the session tonight, like those are all touch points of design. And so I was really getting into these conceptual layers. And now I'm leading this innovation ecosystem, which is all about designing attitudes and cultures and beliefs and why people do what they do. So I'm in a really abstract level of design because I see it as a systems enabler and a force of change. And I could have never defined that as an undergrad. Um, so ultimately design for me is the fabric of what we do and how we do it and how we incentivize and change things. I'll stop there. That's good. Nadine, oh. you go next. <laughs> I hope I can follow that. Um, well, I guess I'll start with where I come from, um, which is actually in some ways similar, I think, to you. And that um, in undergrad, I started with fine arts and then realized I wanted to study everything, which is my yes. personality. I'm a generalist. Um, maybe something in common there. But um, now when I think back, I realize that I was always interested in making things, creating things, but then also understanding humans. Like, why do we do what we do? What does culture have to do with it? All of that good stuff. Um, so that's what I studied. I studied everything, anthropology, psychology, philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end, I somehow had a major. Um, went to Washington, DC. Uh, wanted to work in international development. Had a lot of issues with it. Um, one, I'm very white, <laughs> which doesn't help. Um, two, what I experienced in terms of international development was just very traditional. Um, and I just didn't really appreciate that approach. Um, and then also the lack of creativity um, was really big for me. So, you know, seeing all of these complex challenges and seeing that there was really no creative thinking applied to it um, made me want to go back to design. Um, so after a little while, I actually got my master's in product industrial design um, at Pratt. Realized while I was there, I didn't actually want to be an industrial designer, which is always <laughs> great. Um, but what I did realize, um, especially through my thesis project, working with a couple of other people, was that I was really interested in the design research and understanding the user, understanding you know what everything that goes into a product, a service, and everything you need to know before you even start designing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I just got really lucky. Um, met an awesome person, Deborah Aldean, <laughs> at the BFDA, who told me about catapult design. And um, yeah, so I, I got started there. And it just really, when I saw that, it really clicked because it combined the international development, social impact design, with, um, I already said it, so international development with the design piece, um, which was really exciting for me because I think also aligned with you a little bit. For me, it's not about just designing a specific thing, but instead really understanding the ecosystem around it. Um, so yeah, I think with design, um, my definition would be that it's, it's a creative problem solving and it could be applied really to anything. And with that, it's a mindset, it's a process, and it's a bunch of methods. And those methods, the process and all of that really differs based on what you're doing, but there's always that framework um, with certain constraints, um, understanding the user. So there's certain things that hold true throughout. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> Mike? Hi, I'm Mike. Um, so everything I, I, I got into design actually uh, through uh, on the job. So everything I, I've learned about design has been through being on the job. So I'm like, uh, I, I did not have the, the fortune of going to design school and being <laughs> for, formally educated in design. But I, 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 was a, I was a trained scientist. So I used to, I worked in fruit fly labs. I worked, uh, I dissected lizard brains, <laughs> I poked electrodes into slugs. Uh, that's, that, that, that was where I got my start. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and a lot of it was, um, so uh, I spent 10 years at Kaiser Permanente before my most recent role at Centura Health. And uh, most of my context has been around healthcare and designing within the context of healthcare. And um, I never, also actually knew that design was such a powerful tool for creating social impact until I was at Kaiser. As, as you guys might know, Kaiser Permanente is a mission-driven organization. It's a nonprofit. Um, and um, it's kind of, it's all about kind of bringing commu their community's total health. 
and whether that through, that's through medical care or addressing homelessness or addressing you know, a myriad of that, uh, other issues that impact uh, health. And so, um, yeah, so that's basically me in a nutshell. Uh, I've learned from industrial designers who didn't want to do industrial design. <laughs> I've learned from visual designers that didn't want to do pixel perfect stuff. Um, and and uh, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, I'm Erin Huizinga. Uh, I, I did go to design school, but I, I think your science stuff sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> um, I was pre-med for like a hot minute, and then I, I didn't do well in freshman bio at CU Boulder, and I switched over <laughs> to advertising, so there you go. Um, but yeah, I, I went to design school in Atlanta, and then I went to Chicago. I spent about 18 years there uh, at different uh, graphic design roles there. Uh, and then I turned into more of a strategist and have a pretty stereotypical story of working at a place called IDEO, an innovation firm, and a similar organization called Gravity Tank, which is now part of Salesforce. Um, and just learned so much about human-centered design and uh, really transitioned me from a real tactical designer into more of a design strategy kind of person at that point. Um, but still have a heart of a craft person and a graphic designer at the end of the day um, with this sort of overlay of human-centered design as part of my um, toolbox, if you will. Um, so uh, the sort of realization and aha moment for me was when I was working at Gravity Tank, we got a Gates Foundation project. Um, and I thought, wow, we could work on stuff like this all the time, um, social impact kinds of things. If we maybe started a, a studio that did uh, work for social impact at slightly less fees and um, you know, could do more of these kinds of things all day. Um, so that was six years ago, seven years ago, um, and you know, it's taken us a while to build up um, Desklight um, <laughs> into a company, and uh, we run it here in Denver and have some folks in Chicago as well. Um, so that's my sort of quick professional story. Uh, we worked with McGraw-Hill and Techstars and Denver Public Schools, um, and we work kind of across the whole uh, lifelong learning spectrum um, and try to bridge the gaps between K-12 and higher ed and higher ed into professional development and kind of cross-pollinate those stories and those learnings um, in our collaborations with our clients every day. Um, and we do work around learning design, human-centered design, and brand design. If we were sort of a Venn diagram, you can think about us that way, kind of hitting on all three of those categories in our favorite projects and the work we do. Um, but we also take on projects just in brand or just in um, human-centered design or just in curriculum development and help kind of coach our clients through and, and make some things better um, along the way. So um, that's a little bit more about Desklight. And um, as Krista said at the beginning, I used to teach at Institute of Design in Chicago. And so um, getting everybody together and meeting folks like John and other alum that might be in the audience um, is really neat to kind of bring Chicago and Denver a little closer together, so to speak, tonight. Um, so really, really cool to um, start to kind of share the methodologies and the thoughts here. ID is a really strong program around design methods um, and human-centered design for graduate students. And um, it competes with um, programs like Carnegie Mellon and some others across the country, uh, really strong. And um, alum go into both corporations and organizations to help make design change happen. So I wanted to share a little bit more about ID as well. Um, so the next question for all of us is, uh, what's some challenging work that we've had to kind of think through as social impact designers. So what's one of the biggest challenges that you've had to sort of deal with as a social impact designer versus more of a corporate designer? So who wants to take that one first? Um, I can start since I feel like you're looking at me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking right at you, <laughs> Yeah, self-selecting. I guess I will. Um, well, first of all, I, th I think, you know, looking at the panel um, and recognizing I think I'm the more junior person here, um, you know, speaking maybe a little more towards my transition, which hasn't been that long yet. I mean, I just started at Catapult about four and a half years ago, um, coming directly out of grad school. Um, and I had to learn really quickly. Um, so I think overall, that's just been the challenge, um, you know, to go from 
a grad program where we really didn't learn anything about human-centered design, methodology, and all of that. Really learned, starting to learn during my thesis project, which was all around older adults. And we totally struggled and failed in doing design research. Um, luckily, we learned. Um, and then I learned a lot at Catapult Design in terms of yeah, just watching people like Heather <laughs> um, do the amazing work that she did and does still today. Um, so yeah, I think, I think everything in social impact design, including other areas as well, you know, the struggle is just also the thing that makes it beautiful. You learn every day. And as long as you're open to that, which is also part of the human-centered design mindset, being open to change and being able to adjust on the go and building on um, those learnings is really core to that. Um, nice. There's some smaller <laughs> things too, but that's, I think, the biggest one for start. Good start. <laughs> Mike, what would you say? Um, I actually, I want to build off what you said because I feel like it's absolutely true. I think one of the biggest challenges and also what actually makes design especially exciting today, I think at this point in time, is the multidisciplinary nature of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't just mean within design, but you know, tackling you know, social issues you know, tends to be particularly complex. It, t it tends to be, you know, involve a lot of different stakeholders. And I think that introduces a level of challenge that, um, I don't know, you guys have been in design school, that you maybe not don't get exposure to mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as um, you know, once you get thrown into really complicated areas like education, mm -hmm. health care, mm -hmm. and other social issues. And I think that's a lot of times, you know, you see young designers coming out of design schools. Uh, you see that's where they struggle. and mm -hmm. that's where, But that's also where you yeah. see the greatest growth, you know, um, as this, uh, uh, I think within a design practice is that you, you see this, when designers learn to work in that kind of multifunctional environment with a lot of different with policy folks, with IT folks, with you know clinical workflow folks, with all these other kind of like specialties, it really brings unique perspectives together. It's really awesome to see how the craft can bring all that together to mm -hmm. to render some kind of intent. And so, um, so yeah. No, it's good. It's good. Um, I mean, I think the most challenging thing is imagination. Like, adults don't know how to use imagination. I can't do one more brainstorming session where the top things on post-it notes are, we need more time, we need more money, we need new space. Like, I can predict the results, like, immediately. And it just, it wears you out as a facilitator, as a designer, to be like, where are the, where are the ideas? Like, why can't people brainstorm? And so I did an Ignite Denver talk a few years ago saying imagination, the thing we have that we all stopped using kind of to poke fun at this because it just felt like draining to be the creative in the room all the time. Um, I think you're expected as the designers show up and it's like you bring it all and everybody else is in like organizational management, like efficient process, like they're there to be like gatekeepers and like the process people. Um, so I find that really challenging. Um, it doesn't like wear me out, like I am creative forever, um, but that juice is just like, I want it to be more contagious and I wanna unlock it for people. And so, yeah, playing the silly games and getting people to do icebreakers, there's a reason, because you've got to bring them back to their four-year-old self to, um, to like use magic and make-believe and like transform the world because kids do it better than they do. Um, and then I would just say what's challenging is, I don't know any other work that's more challenging than transforming systems mm -hmm. um, or behavior, like culture. Like these core values we hold that are literally holding us back, the belief systems that you're trying to design new systems for, like you're just up against so much that's ingrained and people don't know they're saying no to you because they just don't, there's no awareness. So breaking down mental barriers, barriers, emotional, psychological, all of that, like that design is like extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you can get money. That's not a problem. I can help you find money if that's your issue, but it's like culture that you cannot shift. Yeah. Yeah, I think building on that to a, a challenge that, two challenges that I'm thinking about. Um, the first one is it never is really done, right? Like this kind of design is never done. There, and, and for folks that are maybe coming from more of a corporate background with, um, you know, delivering a product and seeing it be very successful in the marketplace, or maybe not so successful yeah. in the marketplace, but it has a beginning, middle, and an end, and you kind of are done, and you're moving on to a ne the next project that's sort of in your um, portfolio or on the roadmap for that particular company. But 
Um, yeah. With this kind of work, it's, it, you know, the teams have to con continually question, like, is it good enough? Is yeah. it making incremental change? And how do we know we've succeeded in more of an incremental way than more of a massive sort of big change overnight mm -hmm. kind of way? So kind of managing f people's expectations can be challenging, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second thing is, is also the beautiful thing and also the challenging thing. There's always two sides, right? But um, this idea that in this kind of social impact work, um, there, there tends to be the same people in the room for the entirety of the project, right? Meaning the people that you're doing design research with are usually your stakeholders that are the users or the learners or the patients or whomever that are part of this ecosystem. And they might be with you for the entirety of the, not only the consulting project, but like years to come, right? So that you're not you know, incentivizing them like you would on maybe a um, product design for Samsung by inviting them um, to come participate in the user research, giving them a $50 gift card. And you'll probably never see this person again, ever. But in this work, it's totally different, where you're inviting them in, you're still incentivizing them to come because their time is really valuable, but they're going to want to come back or they're going to want to continue to give you feedback. And they're more than happy to help you with the testing phase later after the discovery phase that they've been part of. So um, it's beautiful because they're around the whole time and they're so invested in the work. Um, but the challenging part is you're so much more accountable in the best possible way, but um, it's going to be with you sometimes for life, if you're, especially if you're in like an in-house innovation sort of position. So um, that's kind of fun to kind of think about and paint the sort of pros and cons of corporate work versus social impact work as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, do you want to ask a question quick right now? Yes. Yeah. Um, I apologize that this is too elementary for the rest of the group, but I work in international development and am really just starting to become acquainted with human-centered design. So I was wondering if one of you wouldn't mind just like kind of a quick description to help me like wrap my head around it a little bit first before we get more into the discussion. Sure, sure. Um, so yes, that's a great question. And um, yeah, maybe we should have level set with that a little bit at the beginning. So apologies. <laughs> Um, so ID specializes in human-centered design and, and teaching on the graduate level this um, design methodology. And all four of us use it in our work every day. Um, so it's different than um, implementation-focused work uh, where oftentimes you're sort of researching something on the computer or a Google search or something um, or doing market analysis or market research. And then you just produce, right? And then you just sort of like hope that it goes well and you aren't actually really talking to your users or the people that are actually going to interact with this solution or system or product every day. Um, so with human-centered design, you're always interacting and bringing in the user or the learner or the patient to your solutions as you make them. And you go through this kind of diverging and converging process for the entirety of the project where you're opening yourself up to learning and then you're going back and you're um, you know, thinking about what you learned and starting to make something and ideate around that. Then you're opening it up again and sort of throwing it back out to your users and saying, what do you think? And it's not about validating at that point, but it's more about understanding more and just kind of putting it, you know, posing it to them and saying, you know, how would you use this or what do you think of this? And then bringing that feedback back and redesigning and recalibrating and reprototyping. And then again, testing it and then coming back. So depending on the scale and scope and budget, of course, of a project, you have um, more or less kind of opportunities to diverge and converge in order to get to some kind of a solution. And so um, I think, again, worth saying, like, with social impact, you have to know when to sort of stop and, and deliver the beta test and say, I think it's good enough to launch it but it could always maybe get a little bit better as we learn and as our users kind of test it and use it and, and, and um, go through the process of giving us more feedback over time. Um, so how, hopefully that's helpful. Do you guys want to add a little bit more to that? Yeah, I think from my point of view, I mean, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and just to add to it, I think what's really important or I think is really critical in human-centered design approach, which one, it's not magic dust, which is actually one of the challenges too. Like, <laughs> you know, it's great that it's more out there these days, um, but it's also, I think, been marketed in a way sometimes that, you know, you just do this thing and then like, you'll have the answer. And it's like, no, it's just another methodology. Mm -hmm. But I think the mindset is really critical. Um, and I think that's the thing that you can actually teach people 
somewhat quickly or like, you know, kind of bring that awareness out there, um, which is, you know, one, think about the user and the stakeholders and the ecosystem at all points of when you're designing. Um, prototyping, um, so, you know, being, being okay with failure upfront, um, you know, and not getting too attached to anything you're doing upfront. Because that's really easy to do, I think, especially for designers, when you create something and then you know you don't want to let it go. <laughs> um, but failing early, um, making things tangible, and you can put it in other people's hands so they can actually react to it fully, not just you know from a distance. Um, yeah, engaging the stakeholders. I mean, some of these things should be part of design in general, I think. But um, I think human-centered design. The whole point there is just we're being very um, active in including certain stakeholders and making sure that we are iterating all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we were planning, had our planning call to kind of talk about tonight, we uh, reflected together on the fact that so much of this um, articulation of definition of this kind of work is about the storytelling and holding up some case studies for everybody to kind of talk through. So I think we'll transition to that. And we have a few kind of show and tell slides behind us um, to kind of tell the story a little bit better with some visual aids. So um, who wants to start with sharing just a, a project example, just one case study about the work you've done and some successes? Do, do we have an order or no? Um, no she, okay. she, yeah, we'll, just, we'll <laughs> transition. Um, I, I can go. Um, I have a couple different examples. So I'm thinking of the one, let's go to um, the ecosystem map, please, Krista. So um, I was working at the University of Colorado Boulder, and this was an innovation initiative for campus, which means campus-wide, we wanted people to adopt a culture and a mindset of being entrepreneurial and taking on challenges and working collaboratively across departments to um, learn how to collaborate and also just think differently and take ideas into the world. And part of where you start with systems is understanding, well, what currently exists? Like, what are the resources we already have on campus? What departments are offering rap rapid prototyping? Where would you find mentorship, support, whatever? And the thing is, like, you've been on websites. Like, you can Google search stuff forever and find, like, a department over here and a resource over there and something there. And it's just, it's, there's like no one place to see all of this. So the first thing you do in systems work, in systems design, is map the system. Because you need to understand what currently exists. And I, this is me um, demonstrating <coughs> blending my graphic design background with my research background, with my systems um, leadership background. Because I took the data, which typically people will just make a spreadsheet. You'd be like, here are all the rapid prototyping sites on campus. Here are all the accelerators. Here are all the hackathon shops, whatever. And they're like, here's a beautiful table. And my brain doesn't work like that. I don't want more spreadsheets. And they just kind of get lost in the shuffle. And I was like, I'm envisioning some kind of infographic. And I want it to make it really easy to understand. But what happened here is a couple things. The mountains represent different categories. So each mountain range is a different part of the ecosystem. So mentoring, competitions, funding, meetups, you name it. I kind of broke the, the map into parts. The orange mountains, the things that exist on top of those, were literally at the campus level. And on the gray, the light gray, were the ones that are off campus, just a stone's throw away that students could access. And on the dark gray were more the academic foundations, like courses and skills that they could build. And then there's sort of a little journey map at the bottom, which is the path, roughly the stepping stones to move through everything. So by visualizing this, first of all, it's just a great like graphic. People were like, oh, I can understand it. It's not a spreadsheet. But it also quantified the resources instantly. You could be like, holy crap, I didn't know we had this much on our campus or in our region. This became way more successful and popular than I ever anticipated. I kind of did it for me as my own little cheat sheet. The next thing I knew, we were printing hundreds and thousands of copies of these. Every visitor that visited campus wanted to take them back home with them. Every time we went to conferences, we would take a stack with us. We had them online and digital copies. People were downloading it. It literally, not, people wanted this so badly because they had never seen it displayed like this. It really just made sense. And it was like the first time anyone had oriented, this is the system. This is what we have to offer. 
So I'd say that was a success of making things that are invisible visible and doing it in a way that is accessible and digestible. Uh, wayfinding is a number one issue I run into all the time with systems design. How do I navigate? How do I find what I need? Where is it? Who do I go to? And everyone's trying to make another online platform or tool, and I'll be honest, adoption rates on those are terrible. So there isn't a great solution, but this is one of many, and this one really worked for me. So I'm doing it again with Futurebound right now. Awesome. Yeah. Do you want to go? You sure. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh compromise case, case study. Success. Success. Right. Right. Case study. Right. Successes. Um, uh, I'll talk about failure because I think uh, this was my first project at Kaiser, and I think we were talking about challenges earlier. I think another big challenge with social impact work is the nature of the work. Uh, I remember when I, I I was I was in consulting for ten years before I went to Kaiser. So Kaiser was my first in. You know, they call it in-house job. And, uh, and I went to my boss and I was like, dude, this is bananas. Like, <laughs> I, I've been working on this project for a year and a half. Mm. Like, consulting engagements are like six weeks to six months. <laughs> you know, you're like, and it's like, and one of the things you learn very quickly about doing work, uh, social impact work and doing work in complex organizations is that uh, the first thing I learned at Kaiser was that it's like growing a forest. It's not like put. It's not like growing tulips. In consulting, <laughs> it's like on the consulting side, it's like tulips. Like <laughs> six weeks, six months, you're in, you're out, you delivered. Like you'll maybe hear back, but then you reengage next season and plant more tulips <laughs> and build on it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so um, this is work I did at Kaiser around redesigning nursing ship change. And the redesign aspect of it actually went really well. It was really easy. Uh, the really hard part was implementing and spreading it through all of Kaiser's hospitals. And part of the reason why was just like in education, yeah. nurses have a lot of autonomy mm -hmm. in their own practice. So the door shuts and what happens inside a room is actually a lot like in, in terms of nursing practice, it's, 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 it's up to the nurse. And, um, and one of the things that we really struggled with is because we tried to implement, and how many of you have implemented some kind of complex program, or some, some kind of program, right? Like, and one of the things, the first pass we did was a very traditional type of implementation. So we developed you know, a playbook, it was really well done, <laughs> and uh, we developed yes. a really great dashboard with all the things that <laughs> like, you know, people, observers can come and check off on. It's okay, everybody's doing this and nobody's doing this, so like that. It was a ginormous failure of implementation because of, because of the personal nature of, the, um, of nursing practice. Mm -hmm. And so what we realized was that we actually had to take a very human-centered approach to the implementation itself. And so what we did, so for example, one of the things we learned very, we, we learned very quickly was that we told the nurses why we were doing this, but they actually didn't understand mm -hmm. why they were doing it. Because they've been practicing, they've been doing shift changes the same way for 45 years. It's never changed. And they're like, there's nothing wrong with it. We've been, we're doing it, like, why are we doing this differently? So the first thing we did was we really developed really, um, like first person ways for people to really see and experience and to create a sense of shared understanding of what it is, why it was so important. Um, we, and, and the other thing we also did was, again, just to make the implementation super human, was to allow them to uh, ex experiment with the things that we were talking about in a very bite-sized way but also in a very first-hand way. Instead of saying, okay, here's, all, here's the 12 things that you need to do as a part of this implementation, we broke it up. Okay, okay, um, bedside reporting. Here's what it needs to look like. Here's what it looks like. Try it out. If you love it, let us know. If you hate it, let us know. If you, know, if you think there's any merit to it, let us know and stuff like that. And so, and then we also, so that was the second thing. And the third way we made it very human was actually customize, allowing, um, anybody know the history behind uh, Betty Crocker cake mix? No. So when it was first <laughs> when it was first developed, Betty Crocker cake mix, all you had to do was add water. Okay, it failed miserably <laughs> because people didn't feel like they were baking, and so <laughs> Betty Crocker took it back, reformulated, awesome. so you had to add egg and or milk, and all of a sudden, it's like people felt like they were baking. This is wow. a very similar thing, like. 
when we, when when people have been practicing something the same way for 40 45 mm -hmm. years you know they 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 need the ability to kind of put their own self into the design and the implementation and the practice of it so we created opportunities for that in the implementation nice. and then the fourth aspect was just the celebration again making it human and mm -hmm. you see a picture of a nurse there she's wearing a silly hat but actually you know <laughs> i can't tell you how many times program implementers show up and you know with their clipboards and their suits and in their <laughs> and and they and, you, and for some reason they expect nurses and and frontline staff to listen to what they have to say or respect what they do and they don't even engage to engage with them as hu humans and as professionals and so i think i think uh engaging people in the implementation process as people and not just in terms of ideas and things you want to do is really important so that, nice. that's awesome first project year and a half <laughs> <laughs> and still not done still not still done, not done. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess mine is actually kind of similar and yet mm -hmm. very different coming from the consulting side. Um, it's actually the kangaroo mother care. Lots of learning experience. <laughs> Alex knows. Um, so we actually, we work together on the project. Um, she worked from grid impact side and I came from, um, yeah, um, I came from catapult design. And so we brought in, Grid impact for, for the behavioral design side and then also, you know, in terms of capacity, the human centered design piece as well. Um, but it, it was a fabulous project for me as well because this was kind of my launch into human centered design by really applying it, um, teaching it actually. Um, so I learned very quickly and I also, I think we all learned certain things that we also shared with our client who was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so they decided to bring us in as consultants for a pretty short period of time, kind of almost in the middle of a project that was already happening, um, implementation research by the World Health Organization, working with um, local partners in India, health professionals, and Ethiopia. And so first of all, so this is a lot of learning experience, so I think a lot of small wins, but I think the challenge um, I really want to highlight behind this, um, one, there wasn't that initial buy-in by our partners, people we were working with. So the World Health Organization, we're assuming, was kind of told, hey, we're doing this because they had the money, the foundation. Um, and some people were on board. Other people had no idea what the heck we were doing there. Um, you know, and it's some people, it was really exciting to see, really took it on and became our HCD champions. Um, but also, you know, people didn't have time to dedicate to this. So this was another huge learning experience in terms of one, yes, initial of I and bringing all the stakeholders in. Human centered design being a part of the project, the work from the very beginning, which is really the number one thing. I mean, you can't just throw in again, human centered design magic and think something's gonna happen. Um, so it would have been really exciting if we could have been there from the very beginning where they were already, you know, by the time we joined, they were already, um, redesigning their their second um what do they call it their approach in getting um kangaroo mother care i guess i should have mentioned that getting a uh, kangaroo kangaroo mother care um be appreciated in the facilities and also um, support the uptake thereof in facilities and outside of facilities um, so we brought human-centered design methodology to these health professionals that were already doing amazing work um, and telling them how they, maybe they should improve their work. Mm -hmm. One, a big issue. <laughs> um, and then again, you know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't that initial value add that was communicated from the very beginning, what human-centered human -centered design could bring to them. I do think there were some small wins in terms of understanding how what they were doing and what we were doing could fit together to actually create something really cool um, and a couple of organizations that we worked with, um, it really worked out and they did, it was because we had those champions that had the time to spend with us. They got it, they got what we were trying to do. And so we did create some really cool prototypes. You know, we kind of tutored them through certain methods in the field, um, talking to patients, talking to the nurses. Um, so small wins there, but I think a lot of 
learning that was done there. Um, so that's kind of an example of mm -hmm. an extreme, extreme consulting gig mm -hmm. where you're kind of thrown in and then you pulled out. So we were even we weren't even there until the very end. Um, and I think it was good in the sense too where we were very open with the foundation and I think they took it to heart. Um, so in a way, money well spent, hopefully, because they learned from it, we learned. Um, but yeah. I think one, sorry, I, I, I think one of the things that uh, <laughs> you're making me think about is that I think also the nature of this kind of work is um, because it's challenging and oftentimes you, you look at successes and failures and I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes like I kind of hit the mark, we kind of hit the mark on on, on the outcomes, but we also kind of fell short in many other ways. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's how, and maybe my experience at Kaiser uh, Colors is, because Kaiser is the kind of place where it's like you put something out and it kind of, it, it, it's, it's, neat, it's never black or white. It's always some shade of gray. And, and sometimes something lives like, you know, you put it out and then it, it, it gets basically shelved and then also for some reason it comes back again <laughs> in eight months or a year or a year and a half like they're like hey did you guys see that work that was really amazing like we should like continue with that and so i think i think it's it, i think binary a binary view of success in so social impact work is I, that's that's not how i've experienced it i've mm -hmm. experienced it in shades of gray some guys sometimes and and, and, I, and i think you know, a lot of times it, the people impact is so important. I mm -hmm. think, I think we don't in our work we mm -hmm. don't have a way of quantifying that mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. uh, because the relational aspects and the people impact is often the continuation of what allows your work to go into the next chapter. Yeah. You know, and so I think you're right. So much of it often is about the buy-in and the capacity building mm -hmm. of the team, um, whether you have it or you don't. Right? right. In terms of um, is it is it the people group you're working to serve, or is it your team in in mm -hmm. kind of an in-house role? And things, y yeah, the things come off the shelf, and you're like, how did that happen? But I'm glad it did. You know, right. um, sometimes you don't really know, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's a lot about the people expectations, the management, the sort of um, massaging of the relationships at the right time in the right place in the right way because yeah, if we're hitting home runs every time everybody be hitting, hitting home runs all the time and mm -hmm. all these things would be solved and we wouldn't have a job you know we wouldn't have anything to do and so I think yeah. I think the nature of it we have to be okay with you know like hey we succeeded here we mm -hmm. failed here but learning from that and move and, and having the relational aspects to, to move on yeah well do any of you uh, like I feel like we're brought in a lot as like the magic people, they're like, oh, we just need the designers to come in. But then we're the ones that challenge the status quo, right? Our job is to disrupt why are we doing it this way and push on their assumptions. And then we turn into the troublemakers mm -hmm. and then we get chastised and then it's like, well, we don't want you anymore. You can go back to your thing. We're gonna keep going with the project the way we were going. Cause I feel like I get called out a lot as the rebel mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if any of you have had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, we say the things people don't want to hear actually. Well, we do the things that people don't want to see. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, actually, I, 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 um, I actually have an example of that. So here's an interesting example of doing things that people didn't want to see. So, <laughs> um, so Kaiser, uh, years ago we were, um, they had gone under, they were trying to reimagine ambulatory, the care experience because they had so much money vested in the facilities that they were about to build because, in, because that's where healthcare, one of the trends is that, you know, putting a, a growth in the ambulatory aspect. So that's outpatient care. And, um, and it was something like crazy, like billions of dollars of, of just facility building. <coughs> and so one of the things that uh, Kaiser leaders I think was very insightful about was like, you know, we should take this opportunity to not just like, just stamp out more facilities, but we should really use this opportunity to reinvent or reimagine what the outpatient care looks like. And so, um, long story short, went through a three year process because that's long, how long it takes to <laughs> think about reimagining the way the facilities are built, reimagining the IT systems that, that, that support 
a, a different kind of experience, reimagining new roles. So, you know, front desk staff, what, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. If we can give them things where they can float and they can actually come see you and talk to you and check you in and instead of, instead of being behind the desk. And this is one of the ideas. So one of the ideas was that, and uh, who is that guy from Gravity Tech Start? One of the co-founders, Chris? Chris Conley. Chris Conley. Chris Conley had this beautiful thing that he said all the time, is that 90% of the work, and it is absolutely true, is done through what he calls imp. Like, do you know Chris Conley? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were talking okay. about that earlier. So imp is the email, 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 meeting, PowerPoint. <laughs> That's how 90% of work gets done. And, I love it. And, and, and to really change something, you have to change the way people collaborate. Mm -hmm. And so what we did, well, one of the concepts, one of the things we did in this work was, uh, so a three-year process, all the concepts, we're three, three months from opening our first, door, uh, first clinics, and people were scrambling. Like there's um, a lot of times when you're executing a new thing, like there's a lot of last mile design decisions that yeah. get made, that, that cross-functional teams have to all make together. But when you change everything at the same time, nobody has a touchstone. Uh -huh. And so what we did was we went to do one of the clinics and we said, okay, this is called, uh, this, is, uh, this is, we're gonna prototype. We're gonna take, we're gonna mock up what the new concept will be and we're actually gonna run it. Nice. So that IT folks can sit there and watch it and so that <laughs> clinical folks can sit there and watch it. And, and then they can all figure out what's going on. And so this was called a, uh, a landing pad. And there were other concepts that were all about patients, uh, inviting patients to engage in, in a more kind of stimulating environment or mm -hmm. a more kind of engaging environment. But what, one of the things we saw was that patients actually didn't go into any of those environments. All they did was sit in front of the door. <laughs> like, because that's what people are trained. And because people are afraid they're gonna miss the call. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, Mr. Smith, your, your appointment's up. People didn't wanna miss it. And so one of the things we realized was because we saw that, we had to create what, what's over there. And so the other picture is a, it's a wait time notification system. Without mm -hmm. this wait time notification system, there was no chance mm -hmm. that people would mill around a clinic and because people just want to sit in front of that door and make sure they're not missed <laughs> and so and so that was a rough and so we actually prototyped that out and we actually had a person so none of this is actually working we actually had three people actually a workflow person wow. like a clinical workflow person an it person and somebody else actually just manually putting stuff in <laughs> and um, be, and this was something that was shot down six months before because everybody thought that doctors wouldn't want it because wow. doctors were saying, mm. oh, we can't get that in an accurate way. You know, it's, it's gonna make me look bad or this, this it's, it's impossible to update. But the three people actually sitting there, they actually figured it out and wow. IT built it off the algorithm wow. based on how they built, figured it out. So this is a really good example That's of great. taking things off of paper, mm -hmm. out of meetings, emails yeah. and presentations and forcing people to work in a different way, and yes. and like and you know people you know at first leadership didn't like that, <laughs> um, but as soon as they started seeing how people were working together, this was this became so valued mm -hmm. in, in, as part of the process. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'll share one more story from um, some of the work that we've done. That that I think it's a good piggyback on on this story, and that um, we were working with Code for America. Does anyone know Code for America at all? Yeah, I'm sure several people do, great. Um, so we partnered with Code for America last year to, um, to be their Colorado partner. Um, they had a grant for 10 different states across the country to do some work around public assistance programs. So um, as we went and um, got to know folks at Arapahoe County, we sort of watched and listened behavior. Um, and we were also asked to kind of think about the big task was looking at their digital website where people go and apply for and um, sustain their public assistance programs like Medicaid, food stamps, and other Colorado programs that they might be eligible for based on their own um, you know, situation. And um, we saw a lot of, of waiting room things that we wanted to solve for as well uh, as, as we went and got to know folks in Arapahoe County's lobby. So things like customer service that, that weren't happening, um, gaps around like 
Do I go to the kiosk or do I go sit here and do I take a number? Do I not? Do I actually just use the website? Um, do I not? A lot of questions. So the, the sort of scope of the project and the sort of relationship developed um, with us and with Code for America because we are looking at, you know, how can we save participants time and, um, you know, also give them a more equitable experience um, across the board and also save the county time because the paper trail wasn't happening. There was a lot of lost data. Um, the systems are out of date, as you can imagine, and this peak system um, that they use for people to go and apply for um, public assistance is very hard to navigate. It's really, really not equitable, and it's painful to go through. So certainly not a good um, UX, UI customer <laughs> experience at all. So uh, what was our part in it? We, we were tasked with being the user research partner on the ground. So it's a good story around human-centered design and sort of the phase one of you know, how do you go in and just learn as much as you can from um, participants that are currently on programs and understand how could we make this um, peak system, if you will, the website that currently exists, more um, uh, equitable, easier to use, um, all of that good stuff. So the team in California, the, they have a very large, robust product team in, uh, at Code for America in California. They would prototype, we would test. They would prototype, we would test. And we report back a synthesis of what we learned from folks every single week. So we were on the ground in uh, the county offices. And also, we would recruit people through Craigslist and meet with them at the Denver libraries across the city to learn as much as we could from um, people on public assistance programs. So I think it's a really great social impact story because we were able to get to know folks and really understand um, how they're filing their paperwork, how they're staying on the programs, how they're falling off the programs, what we can do to help them, and reporting all that back to the county. So there were a lot of insights that came from this work, as you would imagine. Um, I think the biggest, most juicy insight from all the work was learning that it can't be too simple. So of course, the best product Tech designers um, are going to make things as absolutely simple as possible, but sometimes we got some feedback like, wow, that was so easy. It just seems almost too good to be true. Um, it needs to maybe have a little bit more complexity to it. So I think the design team uh, struggled, and there were a lot of um, you know, on-the-fence moments around like, well, do we add something in there? Do we add another page? Do we add another step, another drop down, or do we um, leave it this simple in that you know it's like almost not complete in their mind because they're so seasoned to understand and expect this complexity for better or for worse. Um, so it's still ongoing. They're still kind of testing some things. Um, uh, but it's a pretty cool story. And it was really rewarding work getting to know everybody on, on this, these programs and trying to help them as much as we could through this project. Um, so I'm going to transition us to one more big question that I think came in from one of the folks that signed up um, for tonight through the, through the Eventbrite. Um, big question that really stuck out to us was, how is this work funded? How does it come to be? Oh, and who pays for it? And how do we, how do we uh, make it happen? Like, what's, what are the sort of first steps to onboard a project, get it funded, scope it, and launch it um, into work mode? So. Who wants to take that question first? Maybe a couple examples of how social impact work has been funded for you. Um, I can yeah, start. I mean, just based on how Catapult Design has operated. Um, so we actually, we are a nonprofit, but in a way we have been operating, I would say, more as a social enterprise. Um, so a lot of our um, money comes from just paying for our services. Um, so whether it is through a foundation or a social entrepreneur, or an organization like the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, uh, mouthful. Um, so we, we get a lot of our revenue that way, um, where it's fee for service directly. Um, there is a smaller part, especially now, where um, we do apply for grants directly. Um, but we kind of, I would say, we kind of do it all. Well, maybe not all, but we do have a range of revenue streams, which I think is important. Um, we haven't really received much on the donation side because we really haven't done any fundraising. Um, that's really the only reason. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of that's how we get the money, and it definitely helps to have a reputation, to have a name. So um, since I've been with Catapult, most of the work has come 
through uh, mouth of word, word, word of mouth, word of that one. That <laughs> one. <laughs> the German in me sometimes switches things. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of times we've been very reactive, which is really nice to say. Um, so for someone looking, especially someone new um, in the field looking for funding, um, it, that part can definitely be tough, I would say. And I think it's good to be partnering with people that do maybe already have some connections, some networks, and otherwise, you know, start building that because it really is about yeah. those networks. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's grants out there that you can apply for, but networking mm -hmm. for sure, building strong teams. Yeah, piggybacking off of Nadine. Um, so I've mostly been an entrepreneur working in innovation teams within organizations. And those organizations have been mostly publicly funded with grant dollars. Um, and so then we put out contracts to bring in designers to support us for different contract part of the work. Um, so I've been really fortunate. Sometimes we've had private donors to giving money towards different initiatives I've been part of. Um, I think the RFP pro process, request for proposals, is where I get to like work with my network. So coming to events like this, knowing fellow designers, having collaborated with them, done things at Denver Startup Week or pop-ups where I get to see them facilitate. You know, we get to get to test our energy together. I remember that. And then when people come and ask me for recommendations or suggestions, I, I throw my design network back and I'm like, I know these three great people. So. I think the word of mouth and network and reputation stuff really matters. And then we kind of, like, it's, especially Denver is a smaller community. And so I think that helps navigate. But Futurebound is all privately funded. It's under um, Gary Community Investments. So again, I'm really fortunate, but I'm probably going to bring in designers to help me with different aspects, which is where I go back to my network again. What would you say, Mike? Um, you know, I, I'm also, like, but most of my experience around funding is around inter it's within the organization, and so within the organization like Kaiser, and uh, and so funny story that project around imagine uh, around the where we we started mucking things up in in the clinics uh, that started because there were eleven tracks of IT technologies that were being implemented into these new clinics. One of the tracks of technology were these tablets that they wanted the clinicians to have. And, um, and those tablets touched every single part of the care experience. Mm. And so the way we, it was literally the IT lead found, like, I found us, when we were internal resource, and we said, look, you know, we'll, we'll, we're internal resource, like, we're not a revenue generating machine. We're, we're, we're like a cost center. Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, cover our travel, give us $40,000, we're good to go. <laughs> and actually, so that, that was the first round. We actually ended up doing four rounds of that work. The second round was, you know, um, more than 40. And then the third round was way more than 40. And then the fourth round was way more than that because we, there were kept, people wanted to, people, the operations folks and the urgency around mm -hmm. understanding how these things were going to actually run and op be operationalized, people were getting, uh, people were making incremental mo uh, gains through emails and conference calls and WebExes, and because they couldn't resolve these things without actually trying something together, and so and they saw the value of that, and so we kept doing more and more of it. So there mm -hmm. was four requests for us to do that. So that if that gives you a sense for sometimes like. Big things they don't start. They, big things don't start always start big. Like mm -hmm. and the wins and and and, and I think that it's the small things that that often lead to bigger and bigger things. Because if you've hit on something that's so important to people, and the people who are trying to do make that change, that um, often in itself will drive mm -hmm. the the money. Yeah. So one yeah. one <laughs> quick thing too. Um, yeah. So I, I, I realized that I talk very badly about the Kangaroo Mother Care Project. Um, <laughs> there were some good things that came out of it, and I think some value was added um, in certain areas and for specific people. So we actually, I think, also talking about success or small successes or small impacts um, linked to revenue. So we, ha we did have um, some of the people we work with come back to us and say, hey, that was really cool. Can we do this for real now? <laughs> like whatever that little glimpse was, 
we really like that and like let's partner and do something. Um, so, you know, I mean, kind of what you were saying too, there's that gray area sometimes where like when you're in it, when you're in it in the moment, you might not see all the, the white space, or <laughs> the light, um, but it might come back to you and you're like, huh, that was actually really interesting work. And, you know, it did have an impact on people and mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I nice. think people often I think people oftentimes think that like you need like some level of positional leadership to access some level of funding. And I think I, one of the things that I, you know, I often reflect about, at, at least I try to because I forget all the time is being being uh, aware of your sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. It's often like bigger than you think. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, smaller than it is. Like I, I, I don't know. If, depending I don't, on the day. I, I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, depending on the day. <laughs> but it's like, and and I think more and more, especially in very complex projects and uh, initiatives and efforts, it's people recognize when important and good work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And that sphere of influence, you you don't need positional leadership in order to have. Uh, you know, um, a sphere of influence to do something. You can always do something within your sphere, and I, I, I don't want to, and and I don't want to, like, let that under mm -hmm. what's that uh, put a like undercurrent. I, yeah, it, it, it's really important. I think that's one of the big things I learned about uh, when, while I was at Kaiser was that, you know, regardless of where you are and what part of the organization, you you have the ability to influence work in certain ways, mm -hmm. and that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I think for us, you know, I, I think a lot about um, following the funding and thinking about where funding comes from from different projects, and um, it's always different, you know. And it's kind of like people networks, and you, you think about the, the the financial networks of who funds the projects, how they come about. Um, of course, with the world of innovation in general, like any project at IDEO usually takes months to fund and kind of figure out from the Kaisers or from the corporations, like which budgets will this come from? And um, you know, maybe it'll come from R&D, maybe it'll come from marketing, maybe it'll have to be batched from both. And then you know, six the months from now, yeah, <laughs> six months from now we'll start the project. Um, but you know, with social impact, typically in my experience, it does come from foundations and very generous donors and sometimes sponsorships, but not as often. Um, so when we've worked with foundations, the funding does come from the foundation um, because they budget for an innovation project, or they budget for some kind of um, DNI project, or you know whatever. They kind of budget it a year ahead of time, and then they say, okay, let's start to scope what this project will actually look like and feel like, and who will we bring in to actually run it and and support this work. Um, and you know, as Mike says, uh, you know, sometimes it does start small, um, and you you kind of think about you know small, medium, large in terms of the project and how to scope something. So sometimes it starts as as small as like let's do a sprint, let's do a workshop, you know, and see how the energy goes yeah. and if we like each other and if we feel like we have some outcomes and some spirit, you know, after the day is done, um, that gives us some some evaluation of next steps. Um, but sometimes it's like, okay, we love this very big, giant idea, but we can't put it in our budget till next year, and that's okay, you know. Um, so, and then the medium is, you know, somewhere in between in terms of, um, you know, recalibrating what we can do for a certain budget or how that will work, or if two um, nonprofits come together and kind of batch their budget, for example, because they have the same interest and some kind of objective. So. Like I said, for us, it's always you know very different, and you know you never kind of know. But I think it's kind of fun to kind of figure out you know how how to how to fund a project and how to get something off the ground. Um, and I get the question a lot around, well, can you truly run a firm that is mostly focused on social impact? And I would say yes. You know, we're focused on education and learning, so we um, work with K twelve, higher ed, and professional development, workforce stuff. So. Of course, when we worked with McGraw Hill, they have a budget. You know, that's a business. Um, higher ed usually takes a while to to fund things because they're kind of thinking about like, could we get some some donor to support that, or could we, um, you know, use a little bit of this budget and this budget and kind of sort things around. So sometimes it takes some time from colleges and universities to kind of figure that stuff out. 
K-12, usually it is um, some kind of grant or some kind of um, gift from a company or a foundation to support work. So when we worked with Denver Public Schools, for example, they had gotten a Chase grant and they had started thinking about how do we want to use that? How will we um, make the most impact through this money that we've been given for a certain program? Um, so across the board, happy to explain more or talk about my own experience with that. Um, but with that, we'd love to transition a little bit to some Q&A hoping you guys have some questions to throw at us at this point. So anybody want to start? Yep. Um, great all around and definitely serve at point about uh, imagination <laughs> lacking. Sometimes I wonder if, like when you talk about the gray area and people kind of coming back to things and thinking about it again, it's really because of this lack of imagination. Um, but the thing that I wanted to ask all you folks, because it's a little fuzzy to me, strategy, hmm. design strategy, strategy in general, seems to be a very, very important word in this space. <laughs> and how that's defined seems fuzzy. And I was wondering if you all might be able to comment as someone who works in strategy, what strategy means to maybe you and to your clients. Can I just ask back why you're curious about design strategy, just to give us a little more context? I feel, I feel like uh, it's, it's something that you see everywhere, okay. right? And it, it's something that I feel, like I feel like I do it, okay. but at the same time, it feels like it has a lot of different definitions. Yeah. So um, from you folks' point of view, mm -hmm. would you guys all consider yourself strategists of some kind? I, yes, for me. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yep. So I, I, I think my rough definition would be it's taking the traditional elements of design practice and um, applying it kind of to business thinking. So when I think about the design strategy of Futurebound, it's helping people that don't understand design um, sort of translate back to them. <sighs> This is, this is hard on the spot. Um, the, the big idea is the why and how it connects to their investment, their outcomes, like what it's doing from um, the mission, vision, values of the organization. So what does this lever of design that you're pulling, you're saying we need to have five events, we need to do convenings, we need to create this new space, we are now building a new technology platform what is that getting us and how is that um, a practice of, of creating results? Um, so it's kind of making your argument um, and translating it back to the organization's strategic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, you know, in, as a small business owner, I, I think about being a strategist as a, being a um, conductor, if you will, as a metaphor. You know, like on the business development front, I'm thinking about, well, how how would we potentially like collaborate and be helpful, you know, and support some kind of initiative or, um, you know, on on the implementation, you know, like making sure the creative is is beautiful and well articulated and well strategized in terms of messaging and hitting on on the point based on the research that we were able to find um, on research, thinking about who do we need to recruit for this research that will make all the difference, you know, and, and give us a, a new point of view as we talk to people that will benefit from whatever we're able to make for them. So um, I, I think about strategy in that way, and I think it applies also for previous roles that I had had as a design strategist. And I think it's fair to say um, that depending on what company or organization or even a consulting firm, um, that role is arguably going to be different, and the job descriptions are different if you look at them across the board. And um, folks at ID, I know I've talked about this with, like. Yeah, if you work at you know GE versus another company in Chicago, that design strategy role will really be different. So that is a problem, I think, industry wide. Most vague and most shades it's of gray. Very, very vague. <laughs> yeah, user researchers, pretty clear. Designers, pretty clear, depending on the kind of designer you happen to be. The strategy thing is a yeah. little bit gray yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I think I think I would call myself a. A conductor, if you will, on certain projects and the roles that I had before too, where I wasn't a business owner, I wasn't thinking about the the strategy for where we're going as a studio and thinking about client work, 
but I was thinking just primarily about client work and thinking about, you know, where are we going? Is the, is the design right? Does this feel like it's going off in a different direction because the designers on the project don't really have a great sense of where we're, we're starting from and what the scope of the project is? And does the client team feel like we're valuable and still adding, you know, um, the elements of the work that we're supposed to? So sort of like overseeing yeah. and thinking about everything. That sounds product Mm, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes you're wearing that hat. Sometimes you're. I think it's a. It's a. It's a, you know. I was working on my portfolio today. And oh. I was like, I'm a hybrid person too. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you're wearing like a pro a product manager hat. Sometimes you're wearing a design enablement hat. Sometimes, but the I think the point is is like is oftentimes what I found is that you're creating a container for the work mm -hmm. and you're helping the team make choices and. Um, uh, usually at a high level. Yes. I mean, there and designers are making tons of choices mm -hmm. in their design all the time. But I think with, I guess maybe a better question is like, what happens when you don't have any design strategy? Mm -hmm. What yeah. like I, I think and um, and I think and I think you know being able to kind of serve as that container and filter for the for, for good design work to happen because there are choices that are made. Um, around how it relates to the business or how it relates to the outcomes yeah. or how it relates to the people. You know, I think I don't know, that's kind of how Yeah, I I'll give you another example. In a previous life, I worked at a big architecture firm called Gensler. Many of you guys might have heard of, of this place. And I was hired as a design strategist to um, bridge the gap in a, one of the, Chicago's office is huge. It's one of the big, it's top three Gensler office. And they have many sort of micro studios inside of um, the, the Chicago office. and. One of the studios had, it was sort of a catch-all without too many architects on the team. It was data science people, analysts, consultants graduating from ID and Northwestern and programs like that, and brand people. So I was charged with thinking about how to bridge all three of those groups and being able to sell work back into the architecture studios and hence the clients, right? So we're offering consulting services, brand services, and data analytics to some of the architectural projects. And so um, that example, I think, is less about you know, product, product management or, or, or project management. It's more about like the conducting of yeah. how do you get this system to work functionally inside of a big office, but also add value to the clients yeah. as you figure out how to make everybody work well together. It's another example. But gray, super gray, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my question is on the subject of uh, diversity and inclusion and designing for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a project with a local nonprofit that serves a very diverse group of kids, K-12 kids. Um, and when it comes to curriculum content and when it comes to just cultural references and not this feeling of just another white dude telling people what to do, um, how, how would you approach something like that uh, in a non-tokenizing way, mm -hmm. um, in a way that makes people feel included, but not just because it's a, it, you feel obligated to include them, if you will? I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that open, but that's, my, that's a big challenge we're facing right now is, is that topic. How are, how are you bringing them to the table right now? Um, so we have, the, the organization um, oversees about 35 different, for all intents and purposes, social workers that work with students in Denver Public Schools. And um, the, the counselors, well, the social workers will actually bring pick a student to come in and provide their input at this point. So it's fairly randomized in that way. I, I mean, my initial gut is user testing, right? So can you take your curriculum um, down to the right level for that student and put it in front of them, but not maybe, like do it in context, not out of context. So if you're pulling them to a special room and there's all these adults watching them, they're gonna behave differently, they're gonna feel differently, it's not like the way they would do it in their setting. So as much as possible, take what you've created, put it in front of them and watch what they do and see how they respond and do that with a lot of different types of children from a lot of different backgrounds, that's your, your insight, right? Like you learn from watching what people do. And if these kids are having funny reactions, they're confused, they like it, they don't like it, 
that's your suggestions for what you need to change to make it more relevant for them. And you can interview them too, like do the exercise and then ask them afterwards, what do you think? Like have them reflect because they might be designers with you. Like co-design is a great tool. Can they even be in part of the design team to use them alongside you as opposed to just in context? Those would be my first thoughts. And you're also asking in terms of you as an outsider coming in, maybe not being accustomed or understanding their culture? Is that also, uh, or am I part of it? misunderstanding yeah. I mean, it? So there, there's like, as, as a, I, I studied social entrepreneurship in business school, and so I'm looking at this from the business perspective, but mm -hmm. there's every, every aspect of the business, you have, you have to kind of shift your mind about how it's designed for that person, for that group. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about this because we're basically spinning off this social enterprise from this pretty established nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about it from every every um, part of the organization. From how do you have a board of directors that reflects the population we're serving? How do you right. use content and curriculum, you know, mm -hmm. that is culturally relevant and yeah. that sort of thing? So I guess, generally speaking, is the short yeah. answer. Well, I think that's, I mean, you're hitting on something there with, you know, the, your board also, like, the organization representing mm -hmm. that diversity as well. So I think, I mean, I'm always hyper aware of being very white. <laughs> I always have been. Um, but I think with that, it also helps because I understand that if I go into a certain setting, whatever setting that might be, um, I'm always going to be an outsider. I mean, as a designer, you're always an outsider. And th there's actually, you know, a way you can utilize that, bringing in the outsider perspective and the kind of fresh pers uh, perspective, right? But, um, you know, especially in understanding other cultures, you have to have that connection to that culture. You have to work with someone who understands that culture. And of course, it becomes much more complex when it's not just a couple of different cultures you need to tap into, but a whole range. Um, but that's where you bring onto your team that diversity as well. And you work with people, especially if, you know, researchers, people that are in front of those kids, um, you know, try to really bring in those people that can speak towards their culture, that can understand, you know, what's going on when they're reacting to something in a certain way. Yeah, I, oh, um, coming from Chicago, you know, the, the, every single project we're thinking about this and I think, you know, um, kind of bringing together what we've said so far, um, sort of, you know, removing yourself as the, as the person that's running the project and, you know, having a team that reflects your audience that you're solving for as much as possible, then um, talking to the folks that are ultimately going to benefit from the work, as Sarah Best saying, and then also developing some kind of informal or formal uh, advisory board or, or um, experts that can come in and, and be part of the work as well as much as possible. And there's a book that's really good about this kind of notion. It's called The Alternative. Has anybody else in the room read this book? It's about, um, it's about you know, really thinking about um, creating a system that is enabling and always thinking about designing um, you know, with everybody involved that should be involved instead of like the sometimes typical top-down mentality. It's life-changing. I've recommended it to a lot of people the last few weeks. So The Alternative, really good. I think um, just kind of, uh, you guys hit off on many things. For me, one is structural. Okay, so how can you change the structure? Okay, boards, the people on your team, you uh, like, the, like you can do. That's one one way. Second way is realizing that a lot of times you'll probably get it wrong, and then so uh, for for example, at Kaiser within the quality unit, there is part a big part of driving healthcare quality is is driving. Um, it's driving down the disparities because when you drive down disparities, it's great for everybody. It improves the overall quality. And so it's structural, knowing that you're gonna get it wrong and probably as, as inclusive as you can, making sure that one of the things I think that's really hard about this kind of work is that the funding is always tilted towards the front end. Mm. Um, so we pay a lot of money for the user research. We pay a lot of money for the design and the ideation and the, all those phases, the prototyping. But when you get down to operationalizing and implementing things, there's no more money left. And a lot of times, I think that's where things go wrong. Mm -hmm. you, look at, you look at way consumer packaged goods, organizations and services are set up, two thirds is in marketing and sales. And so two thirds of 
So they spent one third in R&D. Most this is a study by the NH, uh, the National Health Services, looking at healthcare versus other industries in consumer goods and services. Two thirds of the funding is earmarked in getting the getting the product or service to the hands of the people. In healthcare and a lot of other uh, like education, I I don't think that's the case. Two thirds of money is not earmarked on the back end. It's it's and and um, and I think that's something to be addressed. I just want to clarify one other thing. When I hear curriculum, I'm not sure this, the scope and this, the size of that. If you're trying to create a whole year's worth of content, I'd say break it into chunks. Like start with just like one part at a time, like a week's worth of content or a month, and test that. So a little bit at a time to make sure it's culturally relevant, it's hitting the right level. Don't try and do the massive project as your first test. Any other questions? I saw one more hand up at some point. I'll yeah, try John. Um, you touched on this in the last question, and I think it was brought up a bit earlier that it, uh, it, I guess the appetite for this sort of work differs quite a bit from subject area or industry to industry. Mm -hmm. um, so, education, health, housing, I don't know. Uh, Climate change, <laughs> clean water, blah blah blah. blah. Poverty. Yeah, no, no, no. Do you do you feel that there are some uh, of those social impact areas that have a larger appetite and therefore funding for mm. this kind of work than others? How would you put them on the spectrum of sort of like biggest appetite to least appetite? My my first thought on that, I'm I'm. When I worked in education, I really noticed how the foundations were driving more educational decisions than the school systems, right? Because the funding drove, like at that time, Common Core st standards were really big. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is funding it. They're incentivizing every school district with grants to go figure out Common Core. Every school was running in that direction. That was different than you know federal funding and state funding because the bigger dollars were causing more incentives. So I would look at the foundations. I, I think the funders are drawing the roadmaps and directing what social issues they believe in mm -hmm. and what the appetite is for society. So that's just been my perspective on watching that. I'd love to hear from all of you. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I'm, I, I'm, I'm biased for the same reason Sarah Beth's articulating it. And also that's our passion area and what we had been so excited about of thought projects that We've been working on the last several years. So, um, yes, I think you know thinking about what the foundations are funding, but also you know for those that are thinking about a social impact direction, and you know the UN Sustainability Goals feel large, right? Like there's so many compartments to kind of look at. As we started to, we could start to name all of them before we got into the question. Um, you know, pick one or maybe two, but probably one that you're really passionate about and interested in. Um, and, and focus all of your energy on, on that one and finding the funding to go along with that. So I think it's equal parts to John's question, you know, where is, where is the funding going and what are people interested in funding right now in terms of trends and need, um, but also your own personal perspective and, and purpose-driven statement, right, around like, here's what I really wanna sp spend my time doing. So for us, it's, it's education and looking at lifelong learning and making learning more um, engaging and fun and meaningful and really blurring the lines of what traditional education has really looked like and why it's not working very well, especially at the K-12 level. So. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think, I think that was a really good point because you could, I agree with both, you know, foundations have a lot of money and you could be chasing after that money in many different directions and then you might lose the reason why you're doing the kind of work that you're doing. So I think, I mean, all of us, we're doing social impact design because we care about it. That's why you do it. Um, it's not easy, but it's very rewarding in that. Um, I do, I mean, from my point of view, working with Catapult Design, and I might be wrong, but a lot of money is in international development. Um, and again, I, maybe I'm not right on that, but from what I've seen, um, you know, we, we do want to do much more work in the US, but it is, seems to be much harder and there are foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that does international and domestic, but I still, you know, most of their money is going internationally, which is great, but, you know. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I think it, yeah, just going back to what Aaron said, I think it's, there's certain areas, it's good to pay attention where the money is going and where it's coming from, but then always, you know, making sure you know where, where your passion lies and really mm -hmm. develop that out because there is money out there and you can make it happen. I think from my perspective, so there's definitely a lot of appetite within health and healthcare, right? And, um, but that's also, you know, I was a part of a team that was founded in, in the very, in, in applying IDEO's very, very early days, like as an experiment to kind of like apply human centered design in non like widgets, um, basically. And so there's a long history within healthcare already, 15 year history of folks like you guys, like, you know, applying your craft in healthcare. And so that brings us today. I just saw a job posting, uh, you know, with, uh, within Dignity Health for like a human centered design executive position. It was just new. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's in healthcare, it, it is definitely making its way. And, and also, I don't know if you guys know this, but 60% of healthcare is, is in this country is nonprofit. Okay, so, and, and, and these nonprofits, uh, they often have some kind of community benefit or community, like, mm -hmm. like that's part of the operating a nonprofit. And so that's, uh, that's one area. Um, I think one area that like, I, and I think also the, when we're talking about appetite, um, I think also one thing that I've, I'm learning I'm from Aaron and, and, um, and the folks in education that have been kind of, uh, uh, is that I thought healthcare was fragmented. Oh boy. <laughs> you know, let's, I don't know. I keep turning this off and this keeps Such turning popular guy. Off. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I thought healthcare was fragmented. Education is super fragmented. And then you look at poverty, you look at all these other social issues. It's like, and I think there's pockets of appetite in certain places. I was going to say geographic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's either geographic yeah. or within certain disciplines yeah. that are more amenable to it because they're still early. And I think it's, um, uh, yeah, so. But mm -hmm. it, I, I heard an interesting stuff the other day. I don't know the percentage, but. Homelessness is actually an undercurrent of every social issue that is a crisis level right now. And mm -hmm. I think that just really surprised me. I haven't really seen that described in that way before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well with that, we've got just a few minutes. So let's, uh, let's kind of graduate to just mixing and mingling a little bit. Uh, thanks again for coming tonight. And um, please stay in touch and stay if you can for a few minutes to meet some more folks in the room. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.